do that right. Greetings and welcome to Spin a Yarn Live, the Tea Time Book Club and Crafting Circle. Hello. To, this episode is brought to you by the number 15 minutes late and the letter kitty. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Glad we're okay with that. So. I don't have a number. What? <laughs> Never mind. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so today we're talking about Dirty Job by Christopher Moore. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. You can connect with stream by going on Twitter to the and using hashtag yarn it all. Uh, you can also go to the Reddit, r slash spin a yarn live and enter the dirty job discussion thread. Um, I'm keeping that on the screen. Um, so go ahead and send us what you're working on and meanwhile we'll talk about what we're working on. So I'm actually working <laughs> on a project you guys have seen me work on before but this time it's purple instead of teal. So I am working on the princess pullover. Here's a picture. So I'm working on the Princess Pullover, which is available at nitpicks.com uh, for like four bucks or something. I don't remember how much the pattern actually cost. Oh, like three or four dollars, something like that. Uh, and I'm working on it in purple, as you can ho hopefully see. It has a lovely um, cable pattern to it, and uh, this one. You can probably tell is actually it's not for me it is for my friend who is smaller than i am so yes that's what i am working on currently is what oh okay um so i'm still working on this project the season two project season. we have a little bit more of a green hat and yellow hair okay Pretty soon. three guesses <laughs> okay <laughs> this looks like we might need more light in here let me Check this. Ooh, e, ah. Did that help the quality at all? Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um. Oh yeah. And uh, tell okay. us what tea you're we're making. So we uh again are using one of the teas from the tea tea forte uh box that I got for Christmas. Today we are drinking, so, so my tea forte box, there it is, with all the teas, and we are drinking the Estate Darjeeling Black Tea today, and it's actually my favorite one, and this was the last one I had, so I'm sad that it's the last one, but it is very very nice i haven't ever really tried darjeeling tea before and i really really like this nope one. or if you're gonna try new tea try a very high quality version and then that's true you have no idea if you we, like it or not <laughs> we went to i went to tforte.com because i was like these teas these are really really great and i'd like to get more of the estate darjeeling and i went on not to dangerous at all Right, and I went on to their website to look at it, realizing that this is, I, I don't know if it's necessarily old, but it's a company that's been around, but like, old in terms of, it's an English tea company. Where the history comes from. Uh, it, 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 I come from Europe, where the history comes from. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it, it's, it's some pricey stuff, so I, I, I mean, I got the, the, uh, the executive that I work under, I'm his, I'm his admin assistant. He got me this tea. Now I got him some refills for his cross pen, which cross is a pretty high quality pen that you can get out there. So I feel it was pretty equal. He actually called me while I was in the office and he was out on his Christmas break to thank me for it. And I was like, well, you gave me awesome tea. So, well, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it's, it was kind of expensive and it doesn't look like they sell the tea individually. Like when you go to the grocery store, you can get a box of, you know, Twinings Earl Grey or Irish Breakfast or what have you. 
But here it looks like the majority of what they sell are boxes with varieties in them. So we may or may not be continuing our tea forte stuff. There is a good uh, variety pack that has something like 40 tea bags in it for um, 40 or 60 bucks. Oh, I wow. don't remember what it is, but it's loose leaf tea. Yeah. So, you know, you have to measure the quality there. But it's like, it's kind of, I wouldn't say it's on the same level of Tia Vana, which is, of course, owned by Starbucks. Um, like, snootiness, yeah, it's still on the same level as Starbucks. <laughs> but I feel like this is more justified. It's an English tea company that's been around for longer than Starbucks has been around. So, not that they're saying much. Mm hmm. But, but you know, so that's so that's the situation. So I would like to continue with our tea forte because it's so good. Okay, let us go to the various locations. See if anybody submitted what they are working on. Nothing yet. It doesn't look like. Do do do. No. Okay. So dirty job. You wanted a comedy. Slightly irreverent comedy book. Oh my gosh. So, literally, I just finished the book not ten minutes ago. And it's so bittersweet. Mm hmm. You know? Like, I was, because I, because the only book I had read by Christopher Moore before was Lamb. And Lamb, in my opinion, is a straight up comedy. This definitely had funny aspects in it, including references to the, to the television show Supernatural. To the television show Psych. Good show. And to the movie Kill Bill. So I was like, all right, I see the references, and yes, this is this is all pretty funny. But it is a book that deals with death. So there are a couple of scenes that you're just like, oh, when his <laughs> mom died and he and his sister are upset, and I'm just like, oh, yeah. no. And then the end when he finally found love again, and then he dies, and you're just like, oh, so, Same. yeah, I've never read any Christopher Moore, Christopher Moore, and the only thing I know about Christopher Moore is you talk, talking about Lamb. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is Ooh. not a pure comedy. <laughs> no, well, it's a darker comedy. It is a darker comedy. It's also, it definitely has the irreverent aspect to it. Mm -hmm. um, Excuse me. Uh, shame. Shame on a biscuit. Um, shame on a biscuit? Listen. Yes? Listen. Oy vey. Okay. Um, I say oy vey. You know, even though they were... There was... Oh my god. So that was kind of the weird thing. Like, there were uh, a lot of stereotypes in this book. Yeah. A lot of stereotypes. I mean, none more than the two uh, widows who kind of served as Sophie's nannies. Like... Uh-oh. Did you mess up? No. Good. Uh... I, I, like, I liked them. Now, I liked the Russian woman a little bit more than the Chinese woman because that was just... Uh, like, at first, it was kind of funny. Like, the goldfish dies and she takes the goldfish because she's going to cook them. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I guess that's kind of funny. But then she does it with every single pet, including the cockroach. And then, when the hellhounds do show up, she's like, oh, wow, you know, assessing them because they're huge, you know, and, and all this stuff. And it's just like... Yeah. That is just so insensitive. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not up to date on my Chinese uh, stereotypes. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, no, that, that was definitely kind of... Weird. And the weirdest part is at the very end of the book, like, you know, earlier in the oh, book, yes. she had she had caught the little assassin dude who was trying to kill the girl, you know, and, um, and cooked him up and whatever. And then she sees all the other squirrel people and she immediately thinks of karma and, and they say that she's a Buddhist. She's always been a Buddhist. And I'm like, yeah. wait, stop. Buddhists, by definition, are vegetarians because any death, like life is sacred to any and all Buddhists. I knew a Buddhist when I went to college. He was a straight up vegetarian. <laughs> and so I'm just like, wait, she's a Buddhist and she's been stealing his dead pets for the meat? 
not <laughs> selling it or anything. She cooks it at home. And I'm like, what? Because then it's like she, after that, she never ate meat ever again and became a strict vegetarian. I'm like, no, if she was a Buddhist, <laughs> if she was a devout Buddhist, like they said, she would have been a vegetarian anyway. So I was like, ah. So I, I think I wrote my little notes. I was like, did Christopher Moore, like, not do his research <laughs> for this? Like I said. I mean, but then again, if you think about it. It was weird. There's, especially in, you know, America, there's a lot of people who are. Oh, oh my little scissors are not sharp, sharp anymore. It happens. Boo. A um, lot of people who claim religious affinity without really acting in that religion. So I, I'm guessing he maybe was going more that direction. I don't know. Maybe. But yeah, that that's definitely a weird thing when she was always a Buddhist. Of course, talking about Buddhists, I think of... Um, what's his name? Steve from Warehouse 13? Steve, yeah. Yeah, Steve. Uh He's fantastic. Of course he's fantastic. It's Warehouse 13. Yes. <laughs> and he's Iceman's identical twin brother. I thought it was just the same actor. No! They are identical twins! I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> but anyway, time about Christopher Moore. Yes. So, another thing. Okay, so let's see here. What oh. did I... Oh. I'll tell you what was... What? What's up? Mom is making a panda purse. A panda purse? Jeez. <laughs> That's really fancy. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that did get on my nerves was this continual reference to the beta male slash the oh, yes. alpha male. And I was just like, this is getting... First of all, it got real, real annoying real quick. Yeah. I was like, this is a theory that was actually disproven by the original guy who like went out, studied wolves, came back, and said, ah, there is clearly an alpha male or an alpha, you know, female, whatever, of the pack. And, like, he wrote books about it and everyone's like, this is cool. And then he went back to study it more to, like, to make sure he could replicate stuff. And upon further studying, he realized, no, they're not two distinctive alpha males and females. They're just the parents. Like, they're just, yeah. the people they're being dominant towards are literally their offspring. <laughs> so it's like... Oh, wait, so he went to try to retract his statement and wrote a bunch of other books saying, no, no, this alpha beta thing doesn't actually exist. And nobody believed him. Yeah. But, he was upset. <laughs> I mean, yes, I agree. It's really annoying in this book. But in, like, werewolf books, I'm still okay with it, even though knowing it's false. Oh, yeah, but no. Like, Mercy but Thompson, Mercy I like Thompson how... does it, yeah. Speaking of Mercy Thompson, again, we're not getting to her... Probably not until, like... <sighs> Next year. Winter of 2018, yeah. Yeah, um... 2018, 2019. But yeah, because I can see kind of where he was going with his whole... No! Hey! No! You don't do that to my hey, grandfather's hey, hey. chair! Sorry. <laughs> um, where he was kind of going with the beta male, but it was... It kept getting really close to that quote-unquote nice guy um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you get in, like, when you talk about school... Um, kids in school saying, oh yeah, girls always go after the jocks, they don't go after nice guys, but, like, anybody who defines themselves as nice guy, after knowing other people who do, um, those are the types of people who are, like, borderline stalkers, and, like, they want the girl regardless of the girl's desires at all. Right. She is the prize, and they get upset at her for not realizing that they she's not happy with something. jocks and that she would be happier with this boy. And it's like, if she doesn't want you, get over it. Yeah. Move on. Be friends. Friends is a okay. Yeah. You are allowed to be friends with members of the opposite sex. Um, and, you know, develop a new crush and do that. So, yeah, I, I always get super annoyed by nice guys or gentlemen, which is kind of a slightly creepier version at this point. They keep taking all of the words. I know. Which is really annoying. That's my other big annoyance. I know. But, yeah, no, <laughs> just how full of ego they are. Yeah. And but, we get... It's not quite so bad, the beta males in this book. No. They're not quite that bad. But it's of a similar nature where it's like, oh, we're quiet and 
you know, we're not the brave ones, but we run the world and we we always come up with um, solutions and right. everything is thanks to us. And it's like, oh, come on. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little self-centered, but yeah, but still there. And there was one thing. This is really random, but this is this is kind of what happens in Christopher Moore books. Super random things will stick out at you, like like he takes his suits to this one guy to get um, to get his suits tailored and to get them cleaned. Oh jeez! And he always takes them, you know, to this one guy, three fingered um, who is his name because he he uh, hey, pardon. Uh, he also sells fireworks. And um, he did, like, his right hand, he lost two of his fingers um, because of fireworks. You know, sort of a sort of a PSA message there. But also, come here. But also, like, one of his daughters is named Cindy Lou Who. <laughs> and I was like, seriously? I wrote in my notes, I was like, seriously? <laughs> seriously, Christopher Moore? Cindy Lou Who, who was no more than two? Oh, my God. Oh, was, she was more than two. No, I know she was, but it was just still... It <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, yeah. It was just still weird. Another thing that was weird to me is after uh, Charlie has gotten um, shot by the crossbow and Ray has taken him to the emergency room, he's... So, when, you're, when you are studying medicine and you go through residency, regardless of where you're actual um practice is going to be if you are going to be a surgeon or you know if you're going to go into a specific field of study or whatever the uh, as a residence you are required to put in a few hours in the er my father is a physician he's an OBGYN, so you know he doesn't usually deal with you know, like the horrible things you usually get in ER, but he still had to do some time in the ER. It's just a requirement mm. to make sure that you can put up with that. Oh, look at the panda purse. Mm -hmm. That's very cute. Okay, it's really cute. It has little ears that stick out the top. That's adorable. Kind of looks like Poe. Is it? Is it supposed to be modeled after Poe from Kung Fu Panda? <laughs> it, it almost looks like that, doesn't it? It does. It looks like Poe because it's got that little smile. That's adorable. But but anyway, my point is is that if somebody comes in with a gunshot wound, they're given priority. And even though the nurse doesn't know, you know, it's it's a um, it's an arrow. It's from the bolt of an arrow, but it's still a shot wound. And yeah, yeah. it's not a mortal wound, but he still has a hole in his leg. <laughs> and they are given priority over people who say think that their tampon is stuck in their business i only pull that one up because like i said my father's a newbie do and that he has to deal with that so <laughs> that's just the first one i thought of. but Great. like thank you thank you <laughs> shut up but um so i was just kind of like so, so that along with the buddhist thing and her still eating meat i was just kind of like i'm not sure if christopher moore did a lot of research on these particular things now that's fine that's not the point of his book you know his these are just little tiny details that a lot of people wouldn't know about because you know charlie's not like bleeding out when he comes in but he still has a freaking wound in his leg compared to the other people who are in there with less severe wounds or or situations you know it's like he's never been in an emergency room and that's great not having to go through the whole er situation is great but it's just a little thing that I got yeah. that I got a little annoyed on. So my question to you, this has nothing to do with what we were talking about. Okay. How did you feel about his comedy? Oh, I like his darker comedy. It's a little like it's kinda it's off color. I was about to say it's kinda off color, but it's it's straight up off color. It is. Uh, <laughs> but but I mean as somebody who their first exposure to him was a very gritty comedy involving Jesus Christ. I expected the comedy. It did, it did not make me laugh out loud as much as Lamb did. Yeah. I will say that. It was a little disappointing because, like I said, it was, it was, the ending is bittersweet. You know, the hero does die um, and, you know, leave, leaves an orphan daughter to be looked after by her, by her aunt, which is great. You know, I loved Aunt Jane, by the way. She was probably oh, yeah. my favorite. She was really character. good. Loved her and Kat. 
Jassy. I thought they were absolutely wonderful. Uh, but yeah, no, I still, I still liked it. It's still weird though because, you know, Paul and I, the majority of what we talk about on these channels are books that are in a series. So it's been so long, really, since I've read just a standalone book. Yeah. <clears throat> that it's kind of weird. <laughs> just like, I'm not really sure how to react because now I'm not, I don't have to be thinking about the characters anymore because the story is wrapped up. There's an epilogue for everybody. And actually, in a book that has so much death in it, it's nice to see that the characters that you really didn't want to die didn't die. And, like, the main characters that we truly love got to survive. Like, okay, yes, it's depressing that the main protagonist did die, you know, that, that's sad. But, and, and it, it actually, when, when, you know, he's off fighting the demons of death and everyone else is back at his apartment and the other death merchant, you know, fresh looks in his calendar and then Lily looks in it too and sees Asher's name. She's like, why is his name here? You know? And, yeah. and it, and he's like, it wasn't there a couple hours ago. And she's like, Oh God, you know, and I'm just yeah. like, Oh, this is sad. <laughs> Cause it's like, Oh, he has a daughter and he just found love again after being years and years after not, even trying to pay attention to other women because he still felt like that that was a betrayal to his dead wife. It's like, oh. So it was it was that. But then, of course, we yeah. get at the very at the very end, we do see that Audrey, who I am sorry, as sweet and as, like, <laughs> nice and everything that she is, she creeps me out. Really? Like, when she was talking to, like, she grew on me, okay, but when she's first talking... To Charlie and to Fresh, like when they're tied yeah. up and they're oh, yeah. like exchanging notes, and they're like, "No, no, 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 this is how we do it." And she's like, "Well, this is what I've been doing," and I'm like, "That is creepy. Why would you do this?" <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I found her, I found her very creepy, and 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 if you didn't notice, the body that she fashions for him yeah. is the same body of that weird creature that tried to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like. Why? Why do you do this, Christopher? What makes you do this? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> I wasn't really expecting him to permanently die, because a well, good portion of the end of this book was about not dying. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> and then, yeah, as soon as his name appeared in the... In the day planner. The day planner, I'm like, mm, it's definitely not going to happen permanently. And... I do kind of like that he's now stuck in this little mini body. I know, but he's got like this 10 inch long or See, whatever. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah the, that aspect of the comedy I was not a fan of. Oh, okay. Yeah, none of that dirty comedy was anything I was interested in. Um, and there was a lot of it. Yes, there's a lot of it. And so, that's kind of, because that's what made Lamb so amazingly hilarious. Oh. To me. To me in high school. I read it when I was in high school. So, of course, I was at that age, right? But, I mean, because Lamb, Lamb is the gospel according to Biff, Christ's childhood companion. So, it talks all about how, you know, in the Bible, uh, we talk about Christ up until he's about 13. And then he just sort of disappears. And then he comes back and he's 30, 33 years old, something like that. So what Lamb is, the gospel according to Biff, is Biff and Jesus during that interlude. What happened between 13 and 30? Where, you know, where was he? Well, according to Biff, he was, tra he went east and he traveled into Idi India and he traveled into, um, into like China and other places like that. He looked at different religions. He studied the Hindu religion. He studied the Buddhist religion. And at the end, you kind of had this feeling of, you know, if I if I was Christian, I'm not, but but it's kind of like, this is the kind of Jesus that I would like to have as my savior. Somebody who is open-minded, who is very much, ah, well, this is how the Hindus perceive everything. And you know what? That's great because they have faith and that's what's important. And this is what the Buddhists do and that's great. They have faith. You know, that's what's important. You know, all this stuff. But like, so, so yeah, so there are some awkward moments in in Lamb because it's all about them growing up, which includes them going through adolescence, which includes mm. stories about Mary Magdalene and stuff like that. So it's like, 
there's a good bit of dirtiness in it too. Yeah. But it's funny because it's Jesus. Tee hee, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's Biff who's kind of like, whoa, what, you know, what's going on kind of thing and has to come to the terms with the fact that his best buddy is in fact the son of God and does in fact have to die really painfully. And he's like, this really blows, yo. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so that was my first exposure to it. So I was not You're, surprised. Right, right. When this kind of humor came out and I was like, Okay, now I get it. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, for me, there was really only one line I actually laughed out loud at. Uh -huh. that? And it was this early in the book. <laughs> um, but we're following Charlie around as he's inadvertently killing people. Yeah, he is. <laughs> and, also funny. <laughs> um, blah, blah, blah. But William Creek took only one step back off the curb. And then the line, you can't really sugarcoat it at this point, can you? Yeah, no. Where the author are just like, okay. This is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> that that line got me. And then, yeah, the rest of it was like, okay, I see he's going for comedy. I, it's a type of comedy that a lot of people enjoy, mm -hmm. but just not mine. But I, I did really enjoy the world building of it. Um, mm -hmm. Like, it was a very interesting take on death. Or, um, capital D death. <laughs> um, yeah. The only thing that I was kind of annoyed with is that as soon as Sophie was old enough, I mean, it was, it was very clear from the beginning that the reason all the animals were dying, yeah. all the pets were dying, is because they were around Sophie. Right. Not because they were around Charlie, because normally when they died, Charlie wasn't even in the apartment. Yeah. So it was like, well clearly it's Sophie and so everyone's going around you know the demons are saying oh we're the Illuminatus and Charlie's like oh crap I think I'm the Illuminatus and I'm like your daughter points at somebody says kitty and they die yeah how is it not super obvious that your daughter is the one doing all of this I don't understand how it's not obvious to you <laughs> but he was kind of you know Charlie wasn't exactly what you'd call the sharpest knife in the armory so no he certainly wasn't. Nor was any of the people who worked for him. No, yeah, the idea... So, again, it threw me off at first with uh, with Lily and with Ray, but then I remembered, well, this is Christopher Moore we're dealing with. But I didn't like how... I didn't really like how Lily was treated. Right. At least at the beginning. I was, I was oddly enough, okay with her hooking up with Minty Fresh. Oh, yeah. Like, for some reason, that really didn't bother me, despite the fact that he's, like, seven feet tall and still old enough to be her father. And that was kind of, like, the weird part. Although, again, oddly, when she came on to uh, Charlie and she was like, I'm doing this out of, you know, good faith, like, you seriously need to get laid and this is really important. And, like, oddly, I was okay with it. I was like, huh. oh, well... I mean, if it's just like a one-time, you know, one-night stand, you know, you need right. to let off some stress. Because when he went to the massage parlor, obviously he didn't do anything. You know, like, I don't know. The massage parlor thing was kind of weird. Yeah, that was also weird. I mean, again, it's just going on those stereotypes. Um, ooh, I made some sort of knot. Uh-oh. Um, and then, yeah, it took me almost until part three... To realize the Morgan was not one character, but three characters. Oh. I thought there was four characters running around. The Morgan and then the three others. Oh. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. that's... Because, I mean, I don't know... I mean, yes, the Morgan, um, Bride, I think, and a few of the other uh, Gaelic goddesses. They are triple goddesses. Mm -hmm. Um... Which is all, well, I'm fine, but a lot of times when you see them in books, it is just one character. Mm -hmm. Like, um, the Iron Druid series, which has, it has its own issues. Um, but yeah, the Morrigan is one goddess. Right. Um, and yeah, so I just, from all the other fantasy I've read, just uh, kept thinking, then, then, it just kept getting weird. <laughs> well, well, I'll tell you what was what was kind of weird to me. Well, not weird, but it, well, I guess yeah, it was weird. How well, like one of them was um, clearly again not really 
intelligent or couldn't really follow logic very well. That was kind of interesting to me. I was like, so one of them... But, like, uh, who was it? Um, Audrey, near the end, you know, did, like, quick internet research and kind of summarized each of their characteristics. And I believe that one is supposed to be rage. Yeah. So it's kind of like... It's like the difference between Ares and Athena, I guess. You know, Ares is the bloodlust and the rage that gives you the adrenaline rush to defeat your foes. Whereas Athena is like, well, yes, we could just go in and bash him in the head or... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> we could be just a little bit more strategic about it and still win <laughs> yeah um and then we didn't see much from Orcus no and you know as as I'm not gonna say the ending was disappointing <laughs> because I was um you know, Sophie finally goes up to Fresh and she's like, do you have a car? I need I need to go. I need to go now. And, you know, she takes um, her, hell, her hellhounds with her and, of course, defeat all the big bads because she can just point at them and say, kitty. She didn't. She didn't say kitty, which I thought was kind of anticlimactic. I was like, oh, come on, not one kitty. I mean, obviously, she's a couple years older now. Yeah. She, she just, you know, just waved at them and they exploded, <laughs> which was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, there's Orcus. Okay, so what branch so, of mythology does he come from? Um. Is he also Celtic? No, he's. Yeah. Hold on, let me grab it. Um. Do do do. God of the underworld, Punisher of the broken oaths in Italic and Ro- Roman mythology. Oh, okay. Um. As with Hades, the name of God was used for the underworld itself. Now, being Roman, was it a copy of somebody else? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, well, <laughs> uh, do, do, do. it doesn't actually look like it. Um, do, do, do. may have lain in Etruscan religion. Anyways, but from where I know it from, and where probably most people who read Christopher know it from, is Orcus is a god of orcs in the Forgotten Realms setting. But, uh, I know, right? <laughs> um. Would you say that that was his description, though? Because in the book, he was described as being bull-like. Um, do do do. Does it actually get? Oh, it doesn't give. No, it's um do do do. Because like the the visual I kind of got was more of an almost minotaur-looking creature with big leathery bat wings. Yeah. Um. And apparently, a three-foot erection. The so-called Tomb of Orcus. Welcome to Spin a Yarn Live, where we read Wikipedia at you. Um, is an Etrus- The so-called Tomb of Orcus, an Etruscan site at name, is a misnomer resulting from its first discoverers mistaking Orcus, a hairy be- bearded giant, um, that was actually a figure of a cyclops. So yeah, apparently Orcus is a hairy be- bearded giant. Well, they described this guy as being large. Yeah. <laughs> not a cyclops, though, or at least they no, didn't no, no. mention him only having one eye. No, 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 he's not a cyclops. It's that the people who named the tomb Orcus saw a depiction of a cyclops and thought it was Orcus, mm-hmm. and they were wrong. Mm-hmm. I see. Okay, but that's good to know, because I definitely went through the whole book thinking that Christopher Moore just took, like, a D&D deity. Well, he might have done. I mean... <laughs> he might have. He might have. Pretty sure he pretty sure he's a giant nerd to hear. <laughs> um Yeah, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, we didn't get as many underworld deities as I would have hoped. If we were going to be we meant, he, a lot got mentioned because they were all yeah. like, Oh, they're all coming towards us. Right. You know? Right. And I did think that uh when um you know, Minty Fresh commented how a Native American had once called him, like, a, the son of, or the reincarnation of Anubis or something. Mm. I was like, oh, sweet, maybe, you know, that's yeah. that's who he is, and he can totally, like, help out, because it was said that the Morgan were afraid of hounds. Right. And that's why, you know, like, people 
you know, a lot of warriors had the Irish wolfhounds. They rode, rode into battle with Irish wolfhounds. You know, not because they're giant freaking dogs who can take down a horse. No, that doesn't, that, that's just, that's just silly. <laughs> um, they are, by the way. I have met an Irish wolfhound, a female who was small. Okay, her backside was above my hip. Nope. She was small. She was also in trouble because she had stolen somebody's sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, at the run fair. Yeah. <laughs> it was very cute. But anyway. <laughs> but, I, uh, but I had never seen an Irish wolfhound in real life. And, dude, they are huge and lanky. I bet that sucker could run. And I believe totally that they could take down a horse. Yeah. Are you kidding? Good Lord. <laughs> anyway. Not the point. Point is, is that they were talking about how, oh, you know, dogs are, are terrifying for them. Because even a little terrier, a little Jack Russell, was, like, <laughs> scaring the Which was hilarious. When they, yeah, well, when they were, you know, low on energy and had been blued up by, uh, by that one guy. Which I was really happy about. I was like, check it out. The owner of the bookstore, Bookum Dano, that was the name of the bookstore. I liked <laughs> that. I thought that was cool. Um... I can't remember his name. But he knew that they were coming. Like, he... Because he read so oh, yes. much. And that's all he really did. And so he had literal bombs, claymores, installed in his bookstore, knowing that somebody was going to come and get him, but didn't even realize that it was going to be the Morgan. Yeah. And then he was like, well, I've read so much about, you know, stories of soldiers being able to wound you guys in battles or seeing you heal yourselves on the battlefields that I'm going to take my chances. And I think that this will do something. And it does. Like, it's a supreme sacrifice on his part, of course. I mean, he was going to get ripped to shreds by them anyway because yeah. he was 65 or 70 years old, something like that. And so he was just like, well, I'm just going to blow up my own shop. And with all of these shutters, you know, these bulletproof steel shutters that close everybody in, and it's like the planning and the money that he must have put into this, knowing that he was going to use this essentially to have to kill himself. But I'm like, this guy, <laughs> this is like yeah. the hero of the book right here. It I is, I mean, yeah. badass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was very impressed with him. I yeah. was like, oh, this guy is so cool beans. And I'm really sad that we only got two scenes with him. <laughs> and we also got a pun about Claymore's. That, too. I liked that. He's like, you know what a claymore is? And they're like, yeah, it's a sword. And he's like, yeah, yeah but <laughs> we have another thing that's called a claymore these days. Take it out. Beep. <laughs> yeah, I do like how um, the Morrigan were upset with modern technology. The claymore is cars. Cars. Cars are no Because they got good. ran over. <laughs> cars are dumb. Oh, minty fresh. I love the detail that was put into his car, too. Oh my. Like, all of a sudden we get into this really distinctive detail about this car, and I'm like, okay, the car is significant in some manner. I see. It's so essentially a I did tank. actually look. I don't have a picture <clears throat> available. Uh, yeah, I don't have it. But I did look it up, and if you, like, really start looking at it, all of the details pretty much match. Oh, yeah. No, I could... Um, I, instantly knew what kind of car he was talking about because I've seen it in a bunch of films. Yeah. Usually they're red. Because, <clears throat> you know, red. <laughs> but yeah, I instantly knew what kind of car he was talking about and I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> I could see how this could be used to to thwart the goddesses of death. Yes, I see it. <laughs> oh, man. Um... But I was so happy that Minty Fresh wasn't dead because I totally thought he was the first one to die. I was like, oh no, Minty. Yeah. I really liked you. But then, no. He was he was saved by the squirrel people, which still <laughs> freak. I am sorry, but they're terrifying. Like okay, fine. They want they thought that the death merchants were stealing souls for the bad guys. Okay, fine, but you know they they tied up a basset hound with duct tape, which first of all sad. Yeah. And then, so obviously you know you thought oh they killed the other woman they killed Carrie. They didn't. They just they just knocked her unconscious and threw her into a dumpster. Like, okay, fine. She wasn't dead. It's good. But at the same time, I was like, no. <laughs> These things, like the descriptions. The descriptions were so creepy. I was like, ah, uh, especially the little assassin. Like the little assassin dude was the first one we met, right? And and we <clears> actually <throat> saw from his point of view, right. which I I love that section though. I, yes, I, I I did like that. And it's then, so bad. The good way. I know, and I was trying to. I couldn't 
figure it out for the life of me because I was like the hellhounds are still di- are still locked out. So what happened to him? Because somebody snatched him up by the ankles. I was like, what? The hellhounds get there in time? No, they didn't. And then oh, <laughs> the hellhounds go tracking the little creature that was trying to hurt their precious Sophie. They trap it to Mrs. Lang, Mrs. Ling again, and you know she's freaking out and like trying to shove it into the pot. And it's still wearing its little trap. And I'm like, this woman is insane. Yeah. She eats friggin' anything that's not okay. No. <laughs> All right? It's just... Yeah, yeah especially because, yeah, the other uh, Chinese characters we get are the se- laundromat people who are secretly firework makers. Yeah. And it's like, there's... Firework dealers. There's a lot of... There's a lot of stereotypes. But it's yeah, a that. lot of insensitive... Ra- I mean... Even the, um, even the, the Russian woman, you know, has the whole strong like bear thing going on. Although when Charl when Charlie tries to say something like bear, she's like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I really liked her. I thought she was. I thought she was a lot of fun. Yeah, I felt like she was a bit more self aware about it. Yes, like, I, I think so too. I think that was her go to because that was probably. A uh, phrase, one of the first phrases she learned. Not phrase, but... um, Stereotypes? No, 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 no. Um, A saying or whatnot that she could just pick up on. Mm. And then, yeah, after a while, she probably just did it because that was her kind of catchphrase, as it were. Yeah. And then she won't let Charlie... She won't let Charlie use it. Like, "Mm mm-mm. But I did like... I mean, despite the fact that, you know, Mrs. Lang was some sort of... Frankenstein eater person <laughs> thing. Uh, I still, I still did like the two of them. Like you know, yeah. they, you know, there were two widows who they they understood that oh, this poor guy, you know, he was married to you know this great woman and then she died in childbirth and he, now he has to deal with this child and he's clearly not, you know, really psychologically able to handle it. So they picked up the slack. Yeah, you know? and I and and did. I, you can't help but be appreciative because they did nothing but just but love this girl you know totally doted on her and absolutely adored her right as if she as if she was uh their own so you can't you can't not like the women <laughs> but you can still laugh at them because that's what christopher Moore wants you to do yeah he wants you to laugh but at the end of the day i, ha- I have to say like andy weir and we'll do the martian at some point mm. but the humor in his book what i liked better about it i mean for one it's not terribly sexual in nature there are a couple of things that that crop up but uh mainly it's just the we're from the perspective of the martian who is of course stranded on mars but from his perspective the kind of the kind of humor that he has to he has to keep up just for his own mentality because he is truly alone on this planet. So the humor is definitely different. It's it's not like it's not dark. There's definitely dark humor in it because he's alone and probably going to die. Um, but it's still... I liked that writing a lot better. But again, it also has more of a... It's, it's written by somebody who has a very firm grasp of not only astrophysics but chemistry yeah and like all the things that this guy needs to do in order to survive and it's very well written so not that christopher morris isn't real written well written (laughs) but it it, uh i don't know andy weir's book just flows really really well really well (laughs) though i will say this for christopher moore is on this channel oh it's it's cool enough you put your hand on um say that because there's really not a lot left oh sorry okay that's fine that's fine that's your favorite shy blonde candle it is. yes <gasps> and i dropped my cable and you oh, i found it <laughs> can you make sure it's going to fall off yeah sorry yeah i have a little oh. tea thingy that keeps it nice and warm yes oh but what i was going to say is despite almost every or every character being a stereotype and having a lot of negative qualities. I would say this book isn't as sexist as a lot of the things we've done on this oh, channel. Oh, yeah, like, no. 
Oh, all of the females not. were different, which is a plus. Yeah. Um. And again, I loved his sister. Oh yeah, that's I true. Mean, and I couldn't. She was good, and her um girlfriend. And her girlfriend. Cassie, Both of them were very good. They were very good normal characters. people. They were just good characters. I mean, it's not like yeah, like, like almost everybody else in this book has just crazy things going on with them. Yeah. But yeah, those two I think were just. Yeah, they were they normal. were normal. Yeah, they were the they were the normalness amongst the weird. I mean, the only thing <laughs> yeah. I guess weird you can say about them is that well they were lesbians, which isn't weird. But again, he did not go on any stereotypical lesbian. Mm-mm. Although I did think it was hilarious how his sister kept stealing his suits. I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, ah, so my sister and I do with her shoes. We yeah. used to go in and steal each other's shoes all the time. <laughs> but the difference is, is he has these really nice, well tailored men's suits. And she loves the idea of an androgynous look, but they don't fit her quite right. Yeah. what's been tailored for a man who, even though he's thin, still has a different physique. Yeah. And she's like, this, they're just, they're too tight in my butt. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> so, like, everybody else has the stereotypes on them. Like, we talked about the Chinese and Russian uh-huh. caretakers, basically. Yeah. Minty Fresh <laughs> is played up. Um, not as normal stereotypically back black but still a lot of the stereotypical black especially for like you know what I can't. sort of the gay subculture you know what I, well and we never get a confirm or denial that he is gay i mean yes he hooks up with lily that doesn't necessarily mean he, right. he's not bi but you know what i can't help but think yeah is that chris Moore referenced a whole bunch of other things from pop culture, if you will. Like I said, Kill Bill, mm-hmm. Kill Bill in that um, when Charlie goes into battle, he's wearing a yellow and black biker suit. Okay, totally Kill Bill. Uh, All right, I didn't even catch that. Yeah, yeah, I caught it right right there. Have I seen Kill Bill? Yes, I've seen the sure, first Kill I've Bill. Sure, taught, I've been forced you to watch Kill Bill. I love Kill Bill. All right, just saying. Uh, anyway, and then he mentions uh, he mentions Psych in that one of the inspectors has to deal with a uh, polar bear murder incident that took place in Santa Barbara. I was like, okay, clearly a Psych reference. He mentions hellhounds chasing after jazz players, and I was like, oh, supernatural reference. I saw that episode, you know. And then um, and then he's got this big. He's got this big black guy, seven foot tall black guy, but very thin. Maybe not, but very thin and deals with death. And I can't help but think of um, Neil Gaiman's American Gods, in which the main character is a huge individual. He's upwards of six foot six. They never give an exact height. I don't, I, I think they said he was black. His wife was definitely black. Maybe this guy wasn't. He was supposed to be the son of Odin. So how you you do that? Because, I mean, in theory, Odin is, is Nordic. white. Yeah. <laughs> in theory, he's Nordic. But, you know, after we all saw Thor and saw uh, Heimdall being oh my played goodness. by... Did we mention that on this channel? What's his name? Oh, what is his name? Squirrel. Sorry. Squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But being played, but being portrayed by the black actor, you know, who was blind and everything, I was like, oh, that is totes Heimdall. Are you kidding? So, you know, it's all, it's all relative. But, um, uh, but I don't know. Maybe there was some, I don't know. Maybe if I went back and read, uh, read, um, American Gods again. Uh, Idris Elba. Idris Elba. I may oh, be yes. mispronouncing that, but. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, no, that. So maybe it His was portrayal was reference. so good. Oh yeah, he was great. So maybe it was a little reference to American Gods having this really noticeably large black man. But again, I feel like in American Gods he was described as being both broad and yeah. big. You know, as you would think Les Son of Odin would be. Right. Um, whereas Minty Fresh was described as being extremely thin. Um, I feel like I've... The um, stereotype of Minty Fresh feels familiar to me from other things. <clears throat> well, I and think, I can't remember any other things that think, has it, but... I think the idea is that because he's... And he mentioned this to one of the Morgan as she was trying to... She was, like, going towards him and was like, when you go black, you never go back. 
you know, he's like, no, you know, and she says, oh, I've had black. And he's like, no, 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 you might have had like dark brown and blah, 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 but truly black. You never go back, you know? And she's like, huh. you know. Cause oh, I thought that was weird. opposite way around. I thought she was saying it because she was this big black crow. And no. black humans were really just brown because. No, he said you may have had brown whatever. But, right. So I'll see if I can find okay. it. Okay. Um, anyways, but what I was going with all this weirdness is th- I think that's where we get all of this beta male stuff with. Because Ray and Charlie are kind of our two white dudes of the... Um, I mean, I assume Ray is. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but they're the two kind of identifiable males, if you will. So, yeah, doing all this beta male is a stereotype of white males who are not overly secure. So, I mean, as much as we were talking about not liking the beta males, I think it fits with all the other stereotypes. Though... A couple other people who were not really stereotyped were the two policemen. True. I do like them. True. I did like Especially the, cops. the primary one that we. Uh, Riviera? Riviera, yeah. Yeah, Riviera was, was good. good. I liked him a lot. And I liked his, uh, his Native American partner as well. Mm. They only briefly. It was so brief, he was yeah. Native American. Uh-huh. It's in here somewhere. I can't remember when I was sad thinking that Minty had died. I can't. That was much later than that. I am so confused about the timeline of this book because she read this this morning. I did. <laughs> and she mentioned something about Ray having sold off a number of the um, items. And I was like, but she was in part three. And I'm like, how is that part three? I thought that was like early on. Yeah, no, it's after, if, it's after um, that. No, it isn't. No, it's in... It's in part two. No, it's the first of part three. Oh, is it the first of part three when we think Minty's dead? Yeah, it's from Minty's... No, Alvin. No. Lily. Lily. The Morgan. The em- the Emperor. Or, is it in Morgan? No. No, no. The Emperor. Riviera. Lily. Okay, Minty. Minty, yeah, it's near the end of that. Yes, I've had black sit. Oh, said Minty. Yeah, once you have black, you never go back, she said. She said. And then... He said, I've had black. Oh, no, you haven't, lover. Yeah. You've had shades of blah, 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 blah. Yeah, because crows are black. <laughs> That's right. That's Mo- right. Cause she, yeah, because she almost absorbs the light, just yeah. like the hellhounds. Most humans are shades of tan. <laughs> I was wrong. Okay. 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 But that... That's what made me silently chuckle about that scene, because it was now. Now that now that I'm yeah. clear in it, because I was trying to read it kind of quickly. Um, yeah. Yes, that that is that is funny, and and Minty does say, oh, "Good point." <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, you're right. What were we talking about? I don't remember. <laughs> we had a thought. We were following thought. Oh, I was talking about how, yeah, there's only four people who aren't really stereotyped. Now, you said Riviera's partner is Native American. Yes. I I kind of breezed past that. Well, because and they were they were sitting and they were in a cafe and his partner, Quervo or something, I can't remember his partner's name, but he was eating a bison stew. And, yeah. um. And, and uh, Riviera said something like, "Bisons used to be extinct. Didn't your grandfather say they were sacred to you and your people, or something like that?" So that's uh, that's when he said it. Okay, but yeah, because <clears throat> that cop really didn't speak much. No, he did. Which is a Native American stereotype, Native American male quiet, stereotype. This yeah. large, very quiet. Um, person, which I mean, I know, every was, stereotype has. He was described as large, issues. right? Yeah. So it's really, really Riviera and um, Jane and what was her name? What was her Cassie. girlfriend's name? Cassie. Cassandra. Yeah. Yeah, those were the only three I think not really stereotypical. Well, I mean, well, and 
and also, of course, I mean, everybody else was perceived yeah. as pretty much normal. I mean, all, you know, all the people that um, that Charlie went to go see. Right. Especially any, any of the victims. Yeah. Yeah. Any of, well, his clients. He called them clients. clients. Uh, I will say that the one where he actually went in and the woman was dying of liver cancer and she saw him and invited him to sit down and, you know, blah, 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 and knew what he was after. Yeah. She was like, oh, you probably want my pin cushion. It was my grandmother's. It's, you know, over there. Sure enough, that's what was pulsating red. And he stayed. He had the item, but mm-hmm. he stayed until the woman died. And I was like, oh. Yeah, that was very sweet. Yeah. Because it kind of reminded me, there is a book. You now, when I was at um, the University of New Hampshire, I was uh, I was chemistry major and I was pre med, so because that was the direction I was going, I did take a nursing class that uh, had to do with hospice care. Mm. And we read a book called Final Gifts, which I still have. I couldn't bear to part with it. And so the stories were a conglomeration of different uh, experiences that hospice workers or the spouses of you know, individuals who were in need of this care uh, went through. And while a lot of the stories were funny, some of them just left me in tears. And it was just, it kind of reminded me of that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, either Christopher Moore had read the book or maybe he had gone through a death or something like that. But so some of the scenes were actually very, very touching. Like when his mom died and when um, Maddie died and, you know, all all, all of that. Like I was, I was just, oh. So really, really sweet. And I almost cried. Yeah. I almost cried a couple of times. I was like, oh, this is really sweet. And then I was like, wait, this is a Christopher Moore book. I'm not supposed to be feeling sentimental. <laughs> You're supposed to make me laugh, darn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's definitely one of those older stories about the... Usually in terms of um, other people who try and cheat death or run away from death or spend all their time mm-hmm. trying to avoid death and then the positive people who um welcome death like you know death comes for them and they invite them in and you know invite them to tea or whatnot yeah um and then just have like a nice little visit before just walking off peacefully with them um i, I will say one thing that this book definitely did is that you know, a lot of times when people think about someone who is a hospice worker who actually goes in to assist in situations like this, you know, you kind of have two reactions to a hospice worker. Like, either you you don't like them, because some people are like, oh, they help with euthanasia and, and crap Oops. like that, which they don't. Um, you know, or, or they have this weird op- opinion of these people who are maybe... A, obsessed with death or something i don't know i I don't know but this book paints them in a really beautiful light as they should yeah as as it absolutely should because because when he goes you know when his mom well not even not even his mom his mother's boyfriend calls uh jane and charlie and is like your mom is dying of cancer you know and (laughs) you need to come out and everything uh but they go and a hospice worker you know, a, a hospice nurse comes down to say, oh, you know, she's awake and she's she's asking for a buddy. And, you know, Charlie, having been witness to so many deaths like Maddie's, mm-hmm. you know, just has this really great positive, you know, vibe towards the hospice worker. Yeah. It's just like, you know, these are, he, he, call, he calls them like these modern day Valkyries, you know, yeah. shepherding people into the next life. <laughs> In as with dignity and joy and like all this stuff, and yeah. I was like, "Oh, this is really, really sweet." <clears throat> yeah, which gets weird when then you juxtapose that with like various sex scenes. Not really sex scenes, but weird sexual there, stuff. There, and it's like, some, eh. there's <laughs> some weird, there's some weirdness definitely yeah. going on again like with lily like i i was like why would you have her hook up with ray that's yeah. just weird and then she's like she's like hitting him while they're doing it and i'm like also weird <laughs> again she's she baby. is confused about her sexuality maybe not her sexual orientation just 
confused about sex. She's... Yeah. I, I, it, it definitely feels like she was probably a virgin before getting with Ray, and it was one of those... Well, not th- virgin, obviously, which is the thing which doesn't exist. But yes, she probably, you know, the whole... Never mind, it's okay. The, but yeah, she okay. clearly didn't have a, a... She hadn't had a sexual experience before Ray. Right. Because afterwards, she's like, I'm not sure I'm ever going to do that ever again. You know, because, like, when, Char- when Char- <laughs> Charlie asks you... Are you seeing anybody? And she's like, you know, I think I'm going to retract my previous offer. And yeah. she's like, oh, I'm not asking for me. I'm, not, I'm asking for, for that guy over there. And she goes, oh, oh, crap. Like, her her face is a mess, you know, because she had just seen a demon. And she's like, oh, God, cover for me. Let me go and make myself look at presentable. Yeah. So, but, but yeah, it, it was, it was Yeah, really so it was definitely <laughs> an adolescent who was, well. She wasn't an adolescent not anymore. Because she had graduated from culinary school at that point. Yeah, but somebody still new to that aspect of things. Yeah. In a awkward way, because let's face it, our society is not big on proper education and talking about right that sort of thing. So here's another thing, and I don't know if maybe this was just something that wasn't affecting anything, but when they were in the back room, you know, when Charlie was first kind of freaking out how all of these things in his shop were suddenly radioactive. You know, his his definition apparently of radioactive is anything that glows, which, newsflash, not all radioactive substances glow. And <laughs> if you do see the glow... You're already in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're in a lot of effing trouble. But so, anyway, she, um, this is after she had stolen the book. Yeah. She thought the book was supposed to be hers. Um, and of course then she, she got all upset because she was like, I am not death. Yeah. But woe is me in a very, you know... Want to be uh, emo? Well, yeah. Uh, what? What? Want to be goth? Yeah. Who? Who? Who was the actress who played? Who's the actress who played the girl in Beetlejuice? That's who oh. she reminded me of. Oh. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, that, that's who she kind of reminded me of. Was um was the Beetlejuice girl? Mm. And I was just kind of like, except the Beetlejuice girl was better at it yeah <laughs> so yeah. Whether it was because the character was better written or because the actress was able to pull it off better. Or the fact that Tim Burton was directing her. Probably. I don't know. I feel like, and I could be wrong, but I feel like Christopher Moore was definitely writing her as a wannabe goth. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She like was. she was not, she was not written as somebody who's competent in that subculture. Right. But that. But um, but. So there, she was in the back room talking to her friend Abby, who never appears again. You know, yeah. in the book, but. Um, you know, they're saying, they're in the back room surrounded by the soul vessels, and she's like, these are the soul vessels? She's like, yeah, you know, he doesn't want to sell them to anybody, blah, 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 blah. And then, um, there are these, there's this pair of Converse shoes, which were glowing red, and Abby was just like, these are cool, I want these. And she's like, meh, just take them. And we're like, wait. (laughs) So, were they supposed to go to Abby? Did they stop glowing at that point? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, they could have gone to Abby's friend. Well, I mean, it, it that could have been like the path they needed to take, or uh, Lily just messed everything up. Well, I mean, quite, it's really hard to say. Quite possibly. <laughs> Anyways, we are we are beyond our our we are hour yep. at at this point. But I mean, all in all, I'm happy I read it, and like I'm happy I got it for Christmas. I, I enjoy Christopher Moore, and I look forward to reading You Suck, <laughs> which is his vampire novel, which I also got for Christmas, so that would be great. Because, like, it's not like I didn't enjoy the book. I liked it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I'll probably read it again sometime down the line. But, um, but yeah, it was kind of a fun and interesting romp into the idea of, of, uh, of what happens to your soul and the idea that not everybody actually has a soul. You know, because like yeah. Aub- Aubrey can see can see the soul right by her heart chakra, right? You know, and she can she can see it in some people. Not everybody, not everybody has yeah. one, but and then the world is about the souls, um, right. getting up through karma and yeah, it was it was very that whole much, cycle. Yeah, it was very much sort of a reincarnation type thing because yeah. you know at the end she absorbs Rachel's soul, which um, which is good. And everything is, is great Which and fun. also kind of explains a little bit about her because she probably knew that she did not have a soul. 
Yeah. Or possibly thought that if no, she said she, she said did. that she knew she couldn't see her own. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, she was but like she could see I feel like others, but not everybody. When you realize that, that's going to mess you up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. But um, it's, um, I will end on this on this rather humorous note. Oh no! Well, do you have something else to say? No. Oh, were you growling at that? I was growling at no. going too far with my stitches. Gotcha. Uh, I will end on a humorous note. The um, the book cover. Parts of it glows in the dark. So, Christopher Moore oh, yeah. glows in the dark. The outline on the baby's carriage grow, glows in the dark, and uh, bits of the pram glow in the dark. And of course, the scythe and her and her skull face. Um, maybe it's only our book, our copy. Our... His soul is in this book, so, and it's only one copy. I think that was probably what we yeah, were going yeah, yeah. for. So, the first couple of nights I, I was reading this book, uh, Paul was playing a horror game on True. his computer. And his comp- and the whole idea was that it was a program that had a glitch in it, that this game that he was playing. So he was kind of like, uh, he was kind of freaking out already. And I and I turned the lights off and I put the book down and I go, oh look, the book glows in the dark. And he's like, oh god, no, I just have to deal with the game where stuff's glitching out on the game. I don't need stuff glitching out in real life. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. So thanks, Christopher. You made me laugh. <laughs> All right. So- so, so next week. Well, first of all, let's uh, tell our viewers yeah. to go to Twitter at hashtag yarn it all uh, or um, Reddit at r slash spin a yarn live into the Dirty Jobs discussion thread. Let us know how uh, how far you got. Show us pictures or whatnot. I got this far. I got one round. Yay! Yeah, I basically got a line. Um, so <laughs> that's, that's how we did. Um... Next time, we're doing Dresden 5. Death Masks. Death Masks. This, I I enjoy the additions we get to Dresden's universe. We get that two. That we get in this book. We get two really fun characters. One of them is a bodyguard slash hitman guy. He's pretty sweet. He doesn't show up very often, but he's pretty cool. And, uh, and the person he's guarding as well. Very interesting mm. individual. That person comes in this book. Well, yeah, that's oh. her introduction to him. He's the bodyguard for her. So, um, so we get... It's uh, a her you spoil. Um, <laughs> anyway. They're all female! <laughs> um, is... uh, we get to see Susan again. That'll be great. We get to see... No Sue yet. Two more books. Yeah. We lied when we said... Two more books. for Sue. Um, Deadbeat has Sue. And oh my god, I love Sue. And it's got butters. Love butters. Anyway. So... We'll get there. We've also... Because we mentioned last time that we were trying to um, do a couple book reviews in time f- for movies that are coming out for them. Oh, yes. Yes. So, we went and we saw The Last Jedi and we saw a couple of previews before Last Jedi. By the way, loved Last Jedi. I thought mm-hmm. it was pretty cool. Go see it if you haven't. I, had I, I recommend it. <laughs> I had to because a lot of my coworkers were yelling at me. <laughs> Now they can't yell at you. Now they can't. Now, now we discussed it at length, which... So, yeah. we've put together a yeah. idealistic uh, timeline of our reviews all the way up through July 21st. Yes, which will be possibly our one year anniversary of doing this. Possibly. Yeah, we'll have to figure out what episode that is. We'll have to put Osiris in a little bow tie and he'll have to be very fancy. Oh no. I don't know where he is. He's around here somewhere. It depends on which one is our last one, because that could get crazy, but we should do like a black tie one year. That would be hilarious. And that would be all fancy. And then get a little, uh, or get a little white tie for Osiris. He has to. Yeah. He's too cute. It would be super cute. I have to knit him. Um, my plan is to get these up onto the Patreon, which I haven't touched since like episode four. <laughs> um, so I don't think anybody's actually a patron of us so it doesn't matter that i haven't clicked that we've done an episode but that's fine <laughs> um but yeah so goal is for that of course every week we'll, we'll still give you an idea of what's coming up um but oh. yeah we're doing dresden one piece ratch series we're gonna finish off the ratch trilogy yes um the fourth book or the next book that Anne lucky has made providence okay. Um, I quite like. It's def. It's part of the same universe. Is um, it a one-off, or are there going to be sequels to that one? Do you know? It 
feels like a one-off. Okay. It feels like a one-off just set in that. It's like, it's like extras. It's kind of like extras, okay. except with extras, you end up um, grabbing the characters from the Ugly series. Right. Um, midway through and hanging out with them. This Providence is pretty much completely separate. Oh, from, so, we don't, so we don't get to see Torn. No. Or Breck. If yeah, you know. not not in this book. Janie's um, just call herself Torn. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows? I mean, it talks about events that happened at the end of Mercy. the third book, okay. um, which I'm not going to spoil because you haven't, I haven't read it yet. yet. Um, and most of our readers probably haven't. But Provenance is not on our list for the next few months. No, but we are going to do... Um, what are some of the standalones? We're going to do A Wrinkle in Time. Oh, yes. Because we saw a preview for that. And oddly enough, you know, Paul worked at a library. I worked at a bookstore. A bookstore which, of course, every year uh, during summer had a whole table devoted to required summer reading. And usually A Wrinkle of Time was, always, was almost always on that table. And I specifically remember that it was a choice like the school i went to we had summer reading and we had three required books and then that you had to read three more books but from a list you chose those books and i think a wrinkle of time was always on the recommended list but i never actually read it i didn't know what it was about and then i saw the preview and i was like whoa <laughs> whoa this is a whole lot more fantastical than and it I has thought. some good actors in it it and does like uh, i don't really know what's going on either but it has a very similar feel to what's that movie that you and your cousin Hocus squeaked Pocus. when I Hocus said Pocus. I hadn't seen. He hadn't seen but Hocus with Pocus. the three witches of Hocus Pocus, there's yeah. three characters played by prominent actresses. I'm so bad with names. Well, one of them is Oprah but, Winfrey. Yeah. I just recognized her off the bat. I'm not sure the names of the other two. I didn't really get to see their faces. They kind of um, but yeah, they're doing that same kind of three, I don't know what they are, but... Well, that which, trinity of which exists, slightly crazy ladies. Which exists everywhere. Yeah. Oh my god, it is definitely the rule of three. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's very fantastic. And it's like, okay, well, that's yeah. interesting. I've, I've, I've never read it, and I, um, I think I would like to. And then the next one-offs we're going to do after Wrinkle is the Akita series. Uh, that's a manga, and it's nine, nine books long. So, so um, we're going to do three weeks... Of three books a piece. Oh, okay. Um, and that's for the Akita movie that's coming out. Right. And, um, yeah, um, Wrinkle of Time we intend to do yeah. before that movie comes out as well. And then I had looked it up because uh, we were kind of squealing about Spider-Verse <laughs> um, last episode. When I looked it up, I thought in the theater it said something about March. But I think what it said was an, the actual trailer would come out in March. Because it doesn't look like the movie's coming out till um, winter. So we have plenty of time for that one. So don't... If you're not a big comics fan, that's okay. You don't have to worry about it for a while. But spider Um <laughs> But then our short series, we're going to end the Ratch trilogy and end the Hitchhiker's five book trilogy. Right, yeah. And we're going to pick, pick up um, the Keeper's trilogy... By oh I've lost it now Tanya, Tanya Huff, Huff. Yeah. I can see it there and then also the Sabriel series by Garth Nix yes Sabriel Garth series Nix. yeah yeah Garth Nix which again is kind of like um, kind of like Scott Westerfield's The Uglies and the Ancillary series in that it's three main books and then you get a fourth book which yeah. I've actually not read the three main ones I have read have not read the fourth one hmm. I had actually a first edition hardback copy of the fourth one it wasn't mine. So when we, um, shortly after we moved back down uh, here from New Hampshire, I mailed it back to his original owner, who was extremely pleased <laughs> that I had sent it back to her. She yeah. was like, thank you. So, yeah, and then, but I hadn't read it. How many uh, Dresden books are out right now? Four, five, six, 16, seven, eight, 15? 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? No, 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 no. It's got to be 13? 15. It's 15. It's 15. I only see. One, are you two, including three, four, the five, six, seven, side jobs? Eight, nine, 12, 13, 14. Oh, maybe it is 14. I could have sworn Peace Talks was number 16. Oh, yeah, that's Skin Game. That's not Side Jobs. Yeah, 14. And by the end of July, we'll be at Dresden 8. Okay. And, and you know, I know we kind of give Dresden a yeah. lot of guff, but, but really, I, in the summer nights, I feel like that's when, even though I didn't read it, read it, <laughs> um, or reread it, I should say, I, I feel like that's when everything starts to get better, especially because now Murphy's in on the gig. 
Yeah. So that that's when everything starts to take off a little bit. I mean, this one, Death Masks, is definitely a um, situation. <laughs> I mean, they're all situations, but I believe this is the this is the one situation that starts off that starts a whole lot of plot. <laughs> yeah, we'll go with plot instead of shitstorm. But anyway, <laughs> um, because then we then we get we get we get a lot of a lot of things. Skin game by far. It's just it's just so much fun. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's yeah. Once we finish Dresden, we'll swap in Mercy Thompson for that long series. Okay, and then they're our, both ongoing, and they're both pretty and, long. Well, we're we're going to swip swip. We're going to swipe in Mercy Thompson for the first long series that ends, well, now, which could be myth. And when you s okay. Oh, for the first one that ends. Yeah, Myth will probably end first. I don't think it has as many books as Butcher. Yeah. Um, I think that's we, only like four or five more books to go. In. Are we only going to do the Mercy Thompson or are we going to expand it to Alpha and Omega as well? That's a good question. I th think we'll do with Alpha and Omega. Okay. That'll make the series very long. Yeah. That's why, it's in our, short stories. that's why it's in our long series We want to section. include it in short stories. You know what I want to do at some point because What's it's that? so good? I would love to do World War Z. That's just a one-off book, right? Yeah, well, World yeah, War Z Yeah, that can is fit in one, one of our one-off slots after July. That's a lot of fun. If you haven't read World War Z, or if you haven't really... I mean, I have read the Zombie Survival Handbook three times. I just... I can't... It's really... It's really great, okay? It talks about the best weapons that you could possibly use in the event of a zombie attack. It, it talks about your best survival tactics. It's really... It's a great book. <laughs> But, and it takes itself super, super serious. And that's why you can't help but snicker at it. Because it lives, it lives in the humor section. Of course it lives in the humor section because it is so deadpan serious. Yeah. And it is great. <laughs> I have not read it. Oh my god, it's so good. <laughs> it, uh... So yes, that's, that's kind of our plan for the next uh, four months. Four months or so. Four, four yeah. and a half months. We're gonna, and I promise y'all, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be better about this. Now we're switching back to Dresden, which I do have copies of that um, on my Nook already. They're also a lot cheaper. Like the reason is that I, like I said, I usually read when I'm at work because I'm a horrible employee. Um, but <clears throat> a, a dirty job was like over ten dollars to download onto my Nook, and I was like, I don't. The, all the Dresden books are on for the same price, which I think is just the same price as their paperbacks, like seven ninety nine. Yeah, uh, nine ninety nine. I actually I think their digital downloads are seven ninety nine. Yeah. So at least they're not they're not they're not that bad, but it makes it easier to just read it at work. Because when I get home, I just want to do this. <laughs> and it's hard to read a read a uh, physical book when your yeah it's hard hands to... are busy crafting. Absolutely. Whoops, where's my thing? Oh, anyways. All right, all right. So, so let's yeah, see. So we've been rambling. We have been rambling. Uh, let's see if anybody's posted any completion amounts. Do, do, do. Yeah, it looks, it looks like... Nothing uh, in the Reddit. Let me just get these. Do, do, do. Did do, we ever do, figure do. out if it was indeed a panda based off of Poe? Um, that was not sad. Oh, okay. I think it is. Oh, one other little ramble bit. <laughs> Speaking of Kitty... Because Kitty was the death word in this series. Oh my god, it's so funny. Um, I, we had a little bit of snow this past week. Yes, we did. And I blew the snow, and apparently we have some chubby kitties in our neighborhood oh. because they pressed through the snow, which made it stick to the pavement. So when I blew the snow, there was a kitty print still, and if you move slightly to the left, I'll move slightly to the right. We can, uh... Oh, you took the picture. I did. I took the picture and I've added it to... So this is... <laughs> <laughs> this is our driveway with kitty prints that would not come up when I blew... When I used the leaf blower on it. And then we also have... Aww. We talked about our neighbor cat last time. This is one of our um, outdoor ghost. kitties. This is one we call Ghost because he seems to just kind of materialize out of nowhere when he drops by. But he is. He's a foofy kitty. There. Okay. Yep. So, uh... 
And he was far more... It's funny. I took him some food. I took some food out to him, and he seemed far more interested in me petting him than actually getting the food. He still yeah. ate it. He still ate it when I left him, but he was, like, purring and rubbing up against me and everything, which meant I had to immediately wash my hands and everything before I could touch my cat, of course. <laughs> but... <clears throat> okay. And... Bloop. Bloop. Okay. We're back. Did our kitty... Yeah, our kitty made a, an appearance. He did. Um. So, yes, that's... That's our episode, and thank you for watching. Join us next time for Dresden Death Masks. Oh, yeah, one, two, three. Sorry, I'm, count I'm counting things. <laughs> Bye! Bye! <Yeah. laughs>